Hello, my name is Randy Starkey, and I'm the pastor of Mariposa Baptist Church in Stanley, North Carolina. Thanks for joining me today as we have another opportunity to get to know one of the candidates uh, for the office of president at the upcoming election at the Southern Baptist Convention in June, which will be June 13th through 16th uh, in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, I have the privilege today to have uh, with me uh, Randy Adams. He's the executive director of the Northwest Baptist Convention, and he is one of the candidates among several. Um, and he has graciously given me the opportunity to, to meet with him and talk with him and to get to know a little bit about him so that we can all uh, make good, informed decisions when we seek to elect our next president of the Southern Baptist Convention. So please welcome with me uh, Randy Adams, again, the executive director of the Northwest Baptist Convention. Randy, thank you so much for giving me the time to, to sit with you and, and talk with you about some issues in the SBC. You're certainly welcome, Randy. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about these issues that are important to all of us. Well, Randy, first off, uh, of course, as, as you know, uh, we, we don't know each other. Um, I, I reached out to you. You were so gracious to, to respond to me. Uh, I'm sure you get a lot of requests, and I do appreciate that. But um, So there's a lot of folks that, that I know, uh, pastor friends uh, that are concerned and, and care about the Southern Baptist Convention and the next president that they'll elect. Uh, but they probably don't know a whole lot about you either. And so would you take just a moment and provide us with kind of a brief verbal resume? Sure. I grew up in Whitefish, Montana, uh, went to college in Butte, Montana, engineering student, uh, petroleum engineering. I was saved as a, as a young child, went to an Assembly of God church as a young child and was saved. But really, my my salvation was was. Uh, deepened in my heart, you might say, when my brother died. I was 16, he was 14, and his death helped me to understand that without Jesus, life ends poorly. And it became very important to me to take a stand in my school uh, for Christ. I was baptized that year in a Baptist church in Whitefish, a regular Baptist church, and then went to, to a college in Butte. And it was interesting to me, Butte's a Catholic town, but the only non-Catholic group on our campus was the BSU, the Southern Baptist. And it was through BSU that I became a Southern Baptist. That was in 1980. It was interesting to me that there was no other Christian group. And it was then that I learned about the cooperative program and how Southern Baptists are a missionary people and evangelistic people. And, and throughout the entirety of the United States, outside the South, they had ministries to try to reach people. And so that meant a great deal to me. By my senior year, I was the director of the Baptist Student Union, the director had left. God really blessed that year. We had a lot of students saved a lot of growth, and the Lord just changed my heart. Talked to my pastor, surrendered to preach, and moved to Texas. I'd never been to Texas, but went to seminary at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. Knew I needed more training, spent 10 years there, did an MDiv and a PhD, pastored two churches. My first church, you might say, was a restart. We had 10 people, all retired, one teenage boy and the others retired. And, uh, but God did a great work there as well. Two years later, we started a church. That church had never started the church in its almost 100-year history. And so that was a real joy to do that. In Newark, Texas, started that church, then pastored another church in Texas, Italy, Texas, uh, and then was called to a church after my doctoral work uh, in Oklahoma, First Baptist Church, McAllister, Oklahoma. God did a great work in that church, did a lot of missions. Uh, my parents, by the way, became Southern Baptists after I was and my dad ran a sawmill. He uh, resigned from the sawmill when he was 52 and went with the International Mission Board, he and my mom, to Pakistan. And there's a whole story there, but it changed my ministry, uh, them going to Pakistan, because I visited them there, wound up speaking to our missionaries there, and God changed our church in terms of getting directly involved in overseas missions through the IMB. We did a lot of IMB retreats over the years. Uh, partnerships and uh, the work that God did in our church, in our local community, and through missions uh, 
when the time came that Oklahoma Baptists were looking for a missions and evangelism leader that led all of the collegiate ministry, all of the church planting, evangelism, all of that, the executive director asked if I would consider that, which I had never considered ever being a denominational type worker. I loved pastoring. I pastored for 19 years, but I really felt God leading into that role which um, taught me a great deal. Like you mentioned, Randy, it's hard as a pastor to really know how the denomination functions. And uh, for example, what I, I love the IMB, it always participated in the IMB, didn't really understand the role of NAM. Uh, I understood seminaries a little bit because I attended one, but really in that job, working with a a very experienced executive director in a convention like Oklahoma, I learned how the convention convention works. I was our liaison to NAM and to the IMB because both of those were on my team. And, uh, and through that, learned a great deal about how we function and how we function best. Also working with local associations because I'd always been involved on the associational level and had great relationships with my DOMs and learned, however, at the state level of the strategic importance of the association. When the association partnered with the state and the state partnered with the association, we would get a much higher level of involvement from our churches and our pastors. So we did some big things. We did across Oklahoma, which became across North America, in which we took the gospel to 650,000 homes, mostly in one day. We did it a second year, and we went to over 800,000 homes the second year, again, mostly in one day, without the associational involvement and doing the associational rallies and everything leading up to that. Never would have happened in that kind of way. And then, about uh, almost eight years ago now, moved to the Northwest and became the executive director of the Northwest Baptist Convention, which is Washington, Oregon, and North Idaho, about 500 churches. It might interest your pastors to know that Southern Baptists have more churches in the Northwest than anybody else, at least any Protestant group, any other Baptist group. And that's because of the way historically, we started in 1948 with 15 churches, but when we affiliated with the Southern Baptist Convention in 1948, that unleashed a flood of pastors, uh, church planters coming to the Northwest to start churches. A lot of them came out of Texas. By the way, we do have a lot out of North Carolina because years ago, when some of the logging and sawmill industry sort of played out in North Carolina, a lot of folks from North Carolina came to Northwest Washington. So we still have that connection with North Carolina and Northwest Washington. But Southern Baptist pastors came, started churches, and our convention grew to the point where now we have about 500 mission, uh, churches and mission churches, about a third of which, almost a third of which, are non-English. We have a lot of Korean churches, Spanish, Russian, Vietnamese, other language groups along the West Coast, a lot of Asian uh, immigrants. And so most of our, of our uh, diversity comes from immigration from, uh, from Asia. So anyway, it's a wonderful place to serve. God's doing a really great work here in the Northwest. So uh, anyway, that's a little bit about, about who I am. Well, Randy, you had also mentioned earlier to us, and I just wanted to make sure we got this in, is you also serve as, uh, at least at some point or another, you teach some seminary courses? Yes. Okay. Yes, uh, Gateway Seminary, formerly Golden Gate, has a campus in our building. We house them. We provide rent-free space, plus we provide some funding for the work here because we feel it's important to, to educate our pastors here in the Northwest so they don't leave and never come back. It took me 30 years to get back to this part of the country after I moved to Texas. So I do teach. I teach evangelism. I teach preaching, and which my PhD is in preaching. And then I teach strategic planning and ministry finance, which is a really interesting course because what I tell the students is that no one is smart enough to know how to run a church, that you need others to help you. And so I actually have an accountant that helps me on some of the financial aspects of church life. And then I have a lawyer who helps do some of the some of the legal issues that churches face, uh, the governing documents that churches develop, things such as that. So we actually, te I'm the lead teacher, but I involve those two partly to help, partly because I don't know, I'm not an expert in some of those areas, and I want to illustrate to the pastors that they need help and they need to call upon the body of Christ because there are gifts in the body and talents and expertise in the body that they don't have 
But if they're willing to use those talents and gifts and provide people a way to serve in that way, they can uh, further the kingdom in a much greater fashion. Great. Well, Randy, um, there's there's a lot of questions that are floating around nowadays uh, in the SBC um, because of just some things that have arisen over the last uh, couple of years. Uh, again, you know, these aren't really new things. They just really come to a head in particular ways. And and I know there's a lot of pastors like myself who who are interested in knowing, you know, uh, where whoever will end up being our next president, you know, how they perceive these things and how they will lead in these areas. So I want to at least touch on a couple of them um, for the sake of those who would who would view this and so they can get to know kind of where you are on some of these things. So uh, let me just kind of walk through a couple of things and, and give you a chance to respond to these to whatever extent you want to. I realize there's no way for us to talk about every aspect of these things. Uh, but we can at least get an idea about them. So the first thing, obviously, is is kind of what erupted two years ago at the Southern Baptist Convention in Alabama when uh, the messengers uh, approved Resolution 9. Uh, there's been a lot that's grown out of that, a lot of uh, debate, a lot of, uh, you know, for the lack of better words, unfortunately, division in our convention over this. And so now there are, there are those who are at least, uh, I guess, seeking at the next convention to kind of undo the whole Resolution 9 thing. So can you talk to about that just briefly, uh, about the, the entrance of critical race theory and intersectionality as a resolution? Uh, again, subordinate to Scripture, we know that states that, but nevertheless, just that issue that has arisen. Certainly. Well, one thing is uh, I think probably most in the convention hall at the time had very little understanding of critical race theory and intersectionality. They, they didn't know what the issue was, didn't know the implications and the ramification. I think it's always difficult and not helpful to have resolutions discussed and voted on that the messengers really aren't thinking about and aren't uh, informed about at the time. So I think it was a mistake from that perspective. I think it's also a mistake to not address specifics uh, with regard to critical race theory or intersectionality or anything else. The Bible, in my view, holds everything we need to uh, address racial issues, any issues of hatred or racism or trouble between uh, human beings. Uh, the Bible tells us to love God first, love our neighbor second, and it, it instructs us how to do that. Uh, it instructs us that every man and woman, every human being is created in the image and likeness of God. So I think the scripture is sufficient in really all we need in terms of uh, addressing the issue of race. We don't need things beyond that. But as we evaluate things beyond that, like critical race theory, we need to do so with specifics and from the scriptures. And so I think it's always a mistake to draw from something without being very specific and without addressing it from the, from the scriptures. Let me tell you a little story that I heard one time, a, a man talking that I think has helped me in evaluating things like this. I was listening on the radio, it was a poet talking, he was from Northern Ireland, and he was talking about the troubles in Northern Ireland. That's the troubles, if you remember, were sort of a warfare between the Protestants and, and the Catholics, the pro-British and the pro-Irish nationalists, back in the 60s and 70s particularly. And then in the 1990s, they established a peace agreement in which the killing ended. Hundreds of maybe thousands were killed in terrorist bombings and everything in those days. But they established this peace agreement. But the poet said uh, that it did not mean they loved each other. He said the peace agreement kept us from killing each other. It stopped the killing, but it, did, it didn't promote love in the human heart. He said, I guess what you can call it is peaceful bigotry. We're peaceful in that we don't kill each other, but we still hate each other. And therefore he said, it might be what we call a peaceful bigotry. When I heard that, I thought that is the best the world can do. There is no human system, no ism, no philosophy that can produce peace in the human heart or joy or love one human being to another. And the best, the you can get a Nobel prize if you can uh, 
get people to stop killing each other. If you could get the Palestinians and the Jews to stop killing each other or any other conflict in the world, the Hutus and the Tutsis in Rwanda or whatever it might be, stop the killing and you get a Nobel Prize. However, that simply puts in place uh, this situation of peaceful bigotry. I see intersectionality and CRT in something, some fashion like that, trying to address a problem that cannot be addressed apart from Jesus Christ and what Jesus does in the human heart and what the scriptures teach about how to love each other and that uh, peace is only found in the person of Christ. So I just think it's a mistake to go that direction uh, into isms and philosophies and theories outside of scripture. We as the church, we only have one product. We only have one message, and that is the message of Christ and what Jesus does in the human art. When we get into politics as a means of solving our problems or theories outside of Scripture as a means of solving our problems, we get on the wrong turf. That's not where we fight, or that's not where spiritual warfare is fought. Spiritual warfare is fought with biblical truth, the person of Jesus, the power of prayer, and that's really where I think we went wrong in in large measure with critical race theory and the and the resolution number nine. So when we come to the convention this year, how do you think that should be addressed? I mean, what what can be done? What should be done? Well, I you know from what I understand, you cannot undo a resolution. Resolutions, as you know, have no binding power. Right. Um, what you can do is pass a resolution that maybe corrects the thinking that was put in place by a former resolution. I'm certain that will happen at this year's convention. What I would hope is that any resolution presented would focus on the teaching of Scripture. And uh, if there is something, and there is plenty in CRT and intersectionality that conflict with Scripture, Deal with it in a biblical way and deal with it in specific. I've talked to black pastors. I really don't know how many African-American pastors that we have that support CRT. I spoke with a leader in Texas last week, an African-American pastor who's one of the lead pastors in the whole state, has been president of their convention. I think that some of the criticism from them, from him and some others, is that they simply weren't at the table that they weren't consulted. And he said, it's not that I'm in the critical race theory. He said, I'm not. But he said, uh, the image of all white people making decisions and pronouncements involving my life and where I live without talking to me and letting me sit at the table or people who represent me sit at the table. He said, that's really what's stuck in the craw of some of our, of our pastors, of our African-American pastors in particular. Okay. Well, I know there's a lot more that can be said about that particular issue, but I want us to be able to hit a few uh, other things. But one of the things that has kind of uh, erupted, I guess you could say recently, uh, really came uh, to light through uh, the North American Mission Board. It's Again, it's not a new issue. It's, it's one that's been lingering for, for years, but uh, it's kind of renewed uh, in light of the Baptist Faith and Message 2000. And that is that uh, it, social media came, uh, burst out with some church plants that had uh, in them women pastors. Um, can you speak to that particular issue um, as it relates to you know where we stand as Southern Baptists in, in reference to the Baptist Faith and Message 2000? Uh, what, how you would want to see that kind of addressed? Sure. Well, let me say, uh, I've written about some of these things, some at quite length in my blog, randyadams.org. If you want to go read, uh, go to that blog site. I'll continue to post information there. But the North American Mission Board, beginning in 2010, became much more top down so that all of the assessments are controlled and done by NAM. Um, NAM provides 100 percent of the funding now to most every funded church plant. Now, a lot of our new church starts, by the way, are not funded by now. We had 552 new churches in, in 2019, but uh, many of those are not funded by NAM. NAM. But those that are funded by NAM are controlled in some fashion by NAM, meaning they provide 100% of the denominational funding. They do all of the assessment for those. They don't work like they used to with the local and the local state convention. So part of the problem I see it is 
when you have local people involved, local people know situations better. They know their communities better. They know the, uh, the people perhaps that are starting these churches better. And so I think that's one mistake is that we have a national entity trying to control something as massive and as messy often as church planting. It's really, it's really impossible. Uh, and so fundamentally, the lack of partnership the lack of cooperation between NAM and the state convention and the local associations, that is where a lot of the problem lies, right there. And then some of the symptoms of that overall problem are things like church plants that have women pastors or women teaching pastors, uh, which violates the Baptist faith and message. I believe it violates scripture, uh, but certainly it violates the Baptist faith and message. I think we've not seen the end of this. Um, we've seen a few churches revealed. I'm certain we'll see more revelations happen of church plans or sponsoring churches in which NAM, through which NAM puts a lot of money to help some of these new church plants, some of these sponsoring churches that are uh, outside of the Baptist faith and message on the issue of female pastors and other things as well. So this isn't the end of this issue, but I think you confront the issue best when you rely upon local leadership. And I, I, I just think it's not helpful when NAM leadership tries to explain away the problem without uh, taking accountability for the problem. And I think the accountability largely lies in the fact that we have destroyed in large measure partnership. If you've read what I've written, we are planting far fewer churches today than we did 10 and 15 years ago, far, far fewer churches. And we're spending three times the money. Let me just get this in. In 2010, the church planning budget at NAM was 23 million. Today, it's 75 million. It has grown $50 million and the church plant numbers have, have plummeted. NAM has said, you can't trust the numbers before 2010, which I don't buy that at all because, and this is important, if you look at the net increase in Baptist churches in the first decade of the 21st century, it was more than double the net increase in this last decade. The last decade's around 1,800, something like that, churches, net increase. The previous decade was over 4,000. The last five years are the lowest five years in our ministry lifetimes. I've gone back to 1980 and I can't find one year going back to 1980 as low as the last five years are in terms of numbers of church plants. And we're spending $50 million more to get these reduced numbers. Well, you, you raise the question, which is a broad question, which is a good question on, on the issue of uh, accountability. And I'll throw in there from your article, accountability and transparency. Uh, but that most certainly uh, uh, touches on this issue with NAM and, and the church plants and the women pastor issues, uh, uh, but it also extends to other entities as well, which I think that we've seen some, and again, as I told you, I don't fully understand all the implications here, but uh, there's been a lot of questions surrounding some accountability as it relates to the ERLC, the Ethics and Religious mm -hmm. Liberty Commission. So can you just talk about, I mean, in, in, in specifics, the ERLC, but in broad, that whole accountability thing that you, that you brought up? Sure, sure. Well, my platform essentially is transparency, accountability, and participation. That we need more transparency in finances, finances of our entities, and in the performance of our entities. When you hear reports from NAM in particular, you hear anecdotes. You don't hear the overall performance report because it's so bad. What they'll do is cherry pick a few bright spots and tell you about those. So transparency, accountability for how we spend our money and performance of our entities. And then participation really gets at where many of your churches are. You mentioned that your association, a lot of smaller churches. Our convention, the median church is 50. So half of our churches are 50 and below. That's the Southern Baptist Convention, by the way. Most of our churches, the meeting is probably around 70. Most of our churches, half of our churches are 70 and below nationwide. And uh, so what I want to do is provide a way for smaller churches and churches distant from the SBC location to have access to in, to participate in the, in the SBC through remote access voting. It could be remote voting sites in each convention or associations, or it could be done in some other fashion. But I think that's really, really important. Now, regarding the era.
the ERLC, there's a number of things that we have seen in the last year, a lot of things that have made this a very, very difficult year, one of which was the recent election. And we had at least two entity heads endorse candidates or say or speak against a candidate. The ERLC was one of those. I think that's just a mistake to get involved in partisan politics. Stay focused on the issues. Speak to the issues as pastors. We understand that. You can address any issue from Scripture, but don't address personalities and don't uh, actively, uh, you know, uh, endorse uh, a, a candidate, for example. But the worst and most dangerous thing the ERLC did in this last year was they filed an amicus brief on behalf of the North American Mission Board in a lawsuit in which NAM is defending itself in, in a lawsuit with Will McCraney. In NAM's defense, they have literally said, because McCraney's uh, allegation is, is that NAM interfered with his employment, both in the Maryland-Delaware Convention and they have interfered in, in his opportunity for employment post his uh, being the executive director in Maryland-Delaware. So that's the allegation that they interfered. NAM actually, in their legal documents, if you look at it, argue that they are a supporting organization for state conventions. Now, remember, NAM gets all of their money through, most all of their money through state conventions from our churches. But some of that money goes back into state conventions. They said that because they're a supporting organization of state conventions, that they have absolute rights and privileges and that they can actually defame state conventions employees, for example, and they can interfere in the work of the state convention and the employment of people in the state convention because they're a supporting organization. McCraney was not an employee of NAM. He didn't receive any money for his salary from NAM. And yet they said if they wanted to, they could interfere in the personnel policies of a state convention. Uh, which I believe violates the autonomy of states, the autonomy of associations. Um, we do not have ascending and descending liability. There is no umbrella organization in Baptist life. NAM is not uh, over a state convention in any fashion. And that's part of what the lawsuit's about. However, the ERLC filed an amicus brief, and this was went to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, one court under the Supreme Court, in which they said that the SBC is a hierarchy and that the national SBC is the umbrella over all of our churches, our associations, and our state conventions. Now, you can imagine when that was revealed, and it, it sat there for months before it was discovered, when that was discovered, it created a firestorm because it opens up Southern Baptists and all of our churches and entities and conventions to ascending and descending liability in lawsuits. Uh, we are not Catholics. We are not Roman Catholics. We are not hierarchical. Uh, everyone's autonomous and independent in such a way that if you sue one entity, it doesn't bring the other entity into the lawsuit. If you sue one church, it doesn't implicate all other churches. However, the ERLC argument is such that it would undo that. And if we're a hierarchy, now the Southern Baptist Convention is responsible for whatever happens in a local church or a local state convention. It's very, very dangerous. Others have written about it and talked about it. Uh, the ERLC knows it's dangerous. They have said that they're going to file, and maybe they have, because NAM says they're going to appeal this to the Supreme Court. So if this goes, and it will go to the Supreme Court if they appeal it, the Supreme Court will read these arguments. The ERLC may file, and I think will, uh, uh, something to correct that argument, but the argument will still be read by the court. And it was read by the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, and the Fifth Circuit, they nearly won the case, NAM and the ERLC. Uh, it was a nine to eight vote based on that deception. And I say it was deceptive to say that we are a hierarchy. Um, and that NAM had a right to interfere. That was deception because there is nothing in the governing documents of the SBC that could ever be construed in that uh, construed in that way. And and but now that's in the court record, and no one has been held accountable for this. No one's been fired for this. The president of the ERLC has not even spoken to it, and I, to me that is unbelievable. Well, that I'm going to use that to bridge into uh, one final thing I'll ask you about, uh, because I actually 
came into, I guess, became aware of the danger there on, the, on that liability issue through this final issue um, that has been lingering within the Southern Baptists. And because there have been some, some, some lawsuits that have been filed for various reasons uh, and mm-hmm. attempts within the church to then file uh, that lawsuit as well against the association, against the state convention, and, of course, the SBC. And the argument is, as I would argue, we're not a denomination. We're a convention of autonomous churches. And that language has kind of skewed some of that because people talk about the Southern Baptist denomination. Uh, yeah. But we're not. We're, we're Baptist by, mm-hmm. by denomination, but we're a group of churches who convene together and cooperate together. Uh, but the issue upon which I first came into contact with some of those dangers and liability uh, was another issue that you have raised in on the, your most recent article you wrote on your blog, and that has to do with uh, what's been going on concerning abuse in the church. So would you like to just uh, share a few words concerning that particular issue? Certainly. Well, one thing, it illustrates a lot some of the recent things that we've seen with Robin Zacharias, Bill Hybels, and others. Partly, it's the failure of boards, which is one of my great concerns, is that boards often uh, have an attachment to the leader, and they can migrate to the point where they operate to protect the leader or protect the organization and don't represent their constituents, which in our case are Southern Baptist churches. So our trustees of our entities represent Southern Baptist churches to the entity. They do not exist, the trustees, to protect the entity or to protect the leader of the entity. Whenever you get in that position, all kinds of abuse and financial malfeasance and uh, poor performance, things can happen when trustee boards don't hold their leaders accountable. So that's the general principle when it comes to abuse. We saw that with Rabbi Zacharias. It took years before his board would own up to what was going on. And uh, they wouldn't uh, have an outside independent investigation. Hardly any of these groups did that. Even our current president, J.D. Greer, hired a staff member uh, and there was a lot of allegations regarding this staff member, Brian Loritz. the Summit Church did an internal investigation uh, in which now they admit was flawed. And just last month in January, the Summit Church said, we're going to do an external, inv- an independent investigation of this situation. So when it comes to the abuse issue, I think it's always a mistake for a church. Number one, if there's legal issues involved, if laws might have been violated, you always go to the go to the authorities with that. You cannot keep that in-house and try to solve the problem in-house. But the other thing, anytime there's any allegation of sexual abuse or sexual misconduct, there needs to be outside independent uh, investigation of that. Churches and ministry organizations are horrible at investigating themselves. Uh, There's just too many examples of showing that to be true. So we need to allow and ask for independent investigation. Now, when it comes to a database, one of the issues we face as Baptists and evangelical Christians is a person can offend. Maybe it's not a matter of law. Maybe it's adultery or serial adultery or actions such as that. Often churches let the guy go without exposing him, and now he moves to another state and finds another church to pastor. And sometimes these guys migrate from one denomination to another. And we have a lot of that, especially outside the South. In the Northwest, I mean, we've got pastors from all different backgrounds, other Baptist backgrounds, evangelical free backgrounds, independent backgrounds. At some point, they found themselves in a Southern Baptist church. So we need a database, a voluntary database in which churches participate, not just Southern Baptists, but other Baptist groups, evangelical, independent churches, whomever they might be, uh, so that churches can check out in that database. And there would have to be lawyers involved and making sure everything was done correctly. But there needs to be some way in which uh, churches can protect themselves and we can protect the most vulnerable in our churches, the children in our churches, the young women in our churches that often are the recipients of, of abuse. So uh, it, it's a very difficult problem, but I think it's one that we just need, that's, we need to be transparent. We need to own up to it. 
when I, I I'll just give you one personal example. I had a staff member only one time who violated uh, sexual ethics. He didn't break any laws, but he violated sexual ethics. He called me and confessed. His wife met. He resigned on the spot. I, I told him I wanted a letter of resignation, and in the letter, I wanted him to to say why he was resigning, which he did. Had he not done it, I still would have done what I then did, which is email all of our churches and pastors, told them this guy resigned for this reason, because I, I wanted it to be publicly known. Then we put it in our, in our magazine, which is an online magazine as well as print. And I did that to leave a track, to, to leave a digital footprint, as it were, so that if he moved to you know another state and tried to have employment in a church, that that church through a, an online search would find out what he had done. I just think we need to go to that extent because if we don't, we're just perpetuating the problem, foisting the problem onto others. We've all seen it. If you've been in ministry very long, you've seen that happen. I've seen it repeatedly and we've got to put an end to it. And if we don't, we're going to receive the wrath that is due us for not repet, uh, protecting our churches. Well, Randy, is there, I mean, again, I, I'm just touching on a few things that I'm hearing uh, people ask questions about or, or conversations about, but is there anything else that just uh, as you have allowed your name, and we know nobody's technically been not gets nominated until the floor of the convention, but we know that we've allowed your name to be uh, put in the hat. Uh, is there anything else for which you are passionate about that you believe should be uh, on the radar for the next president of the SBC? Well, you know, my whole ministry, like most of us, has been about the Great Commission, the mission of God, advancing the mission. And the thing that first got me in, uh, I say interested, others came to me. I, you don't move to the Northwest if you want to be president of the Baptist Convention. I can tell you that as you would understand. But it's the failure in our mission. If you go back 10 years, we had 2,000 more international missionaries 10 years ago. We were planting far more church. We were baptizing uh, over 100,000 more people 10 years ago. Our cooperative program giving prior to COVID was $62 million down where it was in 2010. We're $80 million down from our peak, and that's the year prior to COVID. So it was all of the mission failure stuff. And it was the fact that I saw changes that happened with the Great Commission Resurgence in 2010 that I believe set up much of what we're seeing in mission failure. So that's really what captured my heart is trying to help us get back on mission in an effective way. But I understood that you have that, that our problem in Southern Baptist life is structural and strategic. The reason, at least one great reason we've seen some of the collapse that we have is because we change structurally how we do evangelism and missions in North America. Uh, and that's largely through the North American Mission Board. But the Great Commission resurgence put into place uh, the structure that led to the new NAM. So um, for me, I say we're always going to have issues. We'll always have issues re regarding race or theology or whatever it might be. And the way that you address all of these issues is through transparency. Just operate in the light. There's only two people or two things that don't like the light. When the light shines, cockroaches flee and guilty people flee. So I think transparency, operating in the light, holding each other accountable for failure and for misdeed, and then expanding the participation to small churches, normal churches, basically normative churches and people that are out there that can't they can't travel to the SBC every year, spend the money, travel the distance, take the vacation. I think we need to involve these people who are supporting our work through the cooperative program. We need to enable them. And by the way, if we've learned anything through COVID, we've learned we can do business through Zoom and through the internet and in virtual ways. I think we can find ways to involve people virtually or in some way other than being physically present in the hall of the convention. So that's really a passion of mine is greater participation, greater transparency, accountability, so that we get back on mission and start reaching people for Jesus in, in, again in, 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 the, in numbers like we should be. 
and sending more missionaries and doing those things that really built our convention. You and I, we are stewards. We, we didn't build this thing. We inherited a great convention and the institutions of our convention. And when someone takes their inheritance and squanders it, that's a, that's a really sick, bad thing. And I see that happening. I think we're squandering much of what we have inherited. I want to stop the squandering and start building back from what we inherited from our forefathers. Well, amen. I do appreciate that, Randy. And, you know, you, you resonate with me because, again, I'm a small church pastor uh, in the eyes of the, the overall SBC. Nobody knows my name. But I, I've come to realize, and I have stayed far from uh, the what we call the politics or the, the policy issues of the convention. This is the first church I've, I've served at that I've, I've really gotten involved in our association in a bigger way, serving on the executive team and those kinds of things. But the reason that I've kind of even reached out to you and, and some of the other candidates is because uh, I really believe that um, this convention is, is going to be significant uh, and that, um, you know, churches like mine, we, as you said, we, we're the majority. We have the ability to have the loudest voice, but we don't feel like that. We, we do not. We feel little. And so we, we don't strive to do a lot. So the reason I'm reaching out to you and, and to the other candidates is to try to encourage my fellow pastors who pastor churches like mine. Uh, mm -hmm. to, to, to get involved and encourage them to go to the convention, to take a messenger, because we know they get at least two, uh, and then uh, to go and, and – and, and, because you think about it, um, if 5,000 churches like mine show up to, at the convention with uh, two messengers, I mean, wow, right? I mean, game changer. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so, that, so I do appreciate, Randy, your time, and, and I know this will be helpful for uh, folks like myself to um, – uh, uh, to kind of know how we should make decisions about the leadership of uh, the Southern Baptist Convention in the next few years. So again, Randy, thank you uh, for your time. Thank you, Randy. Appreciate it very, very much, brother. I just want to remind all of you uh, what I just said, and that is that the convention will take place in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, on June 13th through 16th. And I just strongly want to encourage you pastors uh, plan to go this year. I realize that, you know, it's, it's one of those things that we, we feel like it might not be that important, and I'm guilty of that as well. Uh, but I just want to strongly encourage you to make plans to go this year. If you live in my area, obviously it's, it's, it's much more convenient being in Nashville. It's not that far away. Um, but And plan to take somebody with you if you can from your church, uh, since you do get two messengers at least, and of course more depending on uh, the, the cooperative dollars, giving, those kinds of things. But um, uh, again, I, and take time to try to get to know some of these candidates. I, I think we could say they're all good good guys. It's not an issue of who's bad and who's good, but, but we want to hear what they have to say and how they will lead us so that we can make an informed decision about who we believe that God has, is calling to be the next uh, uh, person at the helm of the Southern Baptist Convention. So again, thank you for taking time to uh, join us and to meet Randy Adams, and I hope that you will have a wonderful day. God bless you.